All right, we're rolling. Wait. Hello, everybody. Tara Bachlin here with the Matthew Wood Institute of Herbalism. We're getting rolling with a very special event tonight. And today is Herbalist Day. And so why not have a special gathering of herbalists and some of your favorite herbalists, I bet, at the Matthew Wood Institute of Herbalism. And so welcome, everybody. Those of you who are joining us in the web webinar, go ahead and say um, chat, uh, chime in in the chat and say hello and where you're from. It's always fun to hear where you're joining us from. And if you're joining us on YouTube, you can do the same in the chat. And uh, we'd love to hear where you're joining us from as well. So welcome everybody. Again, this is a special live event. Those of you who are in the webinar, of course, can participate as usual. Put your questions in the Q&A. We're happy to hear from you there. Um, and it's a real impromptu night. So chime in in the chat, ask your questions. Matt and the crew will get rolling. We'll have a special Herbalist Day event. So happy Herbalist Day to all of you. And Phyllis, I hopefully, hope I properly quoted you, but I believe this is your quote that you don't have to know 25 herbs to be an herbalist. You can just know how to use one herb in 25 ways. Did I get it right? That's it. The art of simpling. Perfect. So I hope that's that's hopeful and inspiring to you because boy, when you see especially even our first year herbs and you're like, wow, I've got to learn 52 herbs. Well, that's a really great thing, first of all. <laughs> you will be glad that you have those in your back pocket so to speak but it's true if you know one herb really well you can do it i've heard amazing stories of how much you can do with just one herb so once again if you're here with us in the webinar love to see where you're joining us from uh, we have we have anna from michigan we have betsy from ohio we have frank from oklahoma and we have our crew here today also. Well, we also have here Holly from Maryland, Muriel from Utah. I bet we'll have some people from all over the world joining us here soon. And our, we have our very own teachers at the Matthew Wood Institute of Herbalism. Of course, you know Phyllis D. Light, who is with us. Carolyn with the pink background is with us. Um, I should highlight a few classes. Well, Phyllis has taught a number of classes at the Matthew Wood Institute of right. Herbalism. <laughs> quite a few classes and uh, while people are settling in here i'll um i'll even go to the website and show you a few and we can get really acquainted phyllis of course um is a major contributor there's even a class tonight which you can still join um to join for free bitter herbs with matthew wood and phyllis delight you can sign up on our homepage. and uh, they have a class coming up as well herbs for the musculoskeletal system and I'm going to show you, um, if I mentioned Materia Medica before, make sure to download our Materia Medica cards, which are absolutely amazing and beautiful. The latest information by Matthew Wood. So if you have his books, this has the updated Materia Medica information. And we are still enrolling in the first year program. So if it's your dream to become an herbalist and you want to be a Matthew Wood certified herbalist, that's the way to go. Now I'm going quick tonight because I want to get to the the Herbalist Day special event, but I also want to show you how you can search for classes. Uh, we have a number of classes with Phyllis. So as you see in the search here, I typed Phyllis. Lots and lots of classes with Phyllis, especially focused on the organ systems. A number of you may not know because Phyllis is so well known for being an herbalist, but she has a traditional naturopathic background as well. And so you'll see more and more classes with her on not only the organ systems, but also nutrition coming to the Matthew Wood Institute of Herbalism. So stay tuned to that because you will have the, the resources to become an extremely well-rounded herbalist. I want to highlight um, a few very unique classes we have with Carolyn Jones, who's with us tonight as well. We have culinary remedies. She does such amazing research, and so they are just thoroughly enjoyable classes. Culinary remedies, exploring health in African American kitchens, black folk herbalism, and herbs for death, dying, and grief. Absolutely amazing classes, well researched. Um, with uh, ex you can tell she has experience and a deep interest and passion in these subjects as well. And then Amanda. <laughs> Um, specializes in, in the plant attunement and animal medicine. She's also in a number of the herbs A to Z classes. And these are absolutely fascinating and very, very enjoyable. And there really are 
fundamental to the Matthew Wood Institute of Herbalism. Matt focuses on a spiritual approach to herbalism. And so these classes are actually, I would say, cornerstone-like content, if not the cornerstone um, principles of the Matthew Wood Institute of Herbalism, especially animal medicine, which um, Matt's new book that is coming out being released at the very beginning of July, we'll put a link, uh, I'll pull that up in a, in a bit here. You can pre-order the book, A Shamanic Herbal. I'll pull that up in a bit so you can uh, see where to pre-order that. Now we're going to have some other surprise guests today. Oh, and there's another one already <laughs> since I was introducing none other than Susan Leopold of the United Plant Savers. And we are huge fans of the United Plant Savers at the Matthew Wood Institute of Herbalism. I'm going to pull up because, of course, without the plants, we wouldn't have herbs to be herbalists. And, um, well, that's a simplistic way of putting it, but so many more, right? Without the plants, we'd, we'd be in pretty big trouble. So we are huge advocates of the United Plant Savers. And for example, when you become a year one program student, you're automatically um, enrolled as a member in the United Plant Savers. And so um, it's a very reasonable price. I believe it's, is it always $35 or um, basic, the basic entry point? It's always been $35. <laughs> I mean, it's absolutely amazing for the, the benefits you get and even even just for the discounts you get on on partners. Um, Matthew Wood Institute of Herbalism is one of those. Actually, it's the only organization we authorize a coupon for. So if uh, so, just a big hint there. So. Uh -huh. <laughs> So welcome everybody. Um, I'll maybe jump in every once in a while, but I want to hand it over to Matt and our wonderful teachers and to get rolling with Herbalist Day. And um, let's just get going. Let's see what, what comes of this. This will be fun. Well, we're very fortunate that I got an email from Rosemary Gladstar's office and she is really, I would have to say, uh, a, uh, she's the grandmother of current herbalism and um, or mother, whatever. And um, I think that this came from her and her group there that they said, we need an herbalist day. And I guess it's every, do you know, Susan, is that true? Yeah. I, I don't, I don't know. I got the email from Rosemary too. So I think she's just trying to be, hype up herbalist day, which is great, but yeah, every day is herbalist day. Right. So. <laughs> yeah. But it's great because now I'm on this webinar with all of yep. you people. Yeah. I don't get to see very often. Hi, Phyllis. Hey there. <laughs> so this, I think it was today I received the email or maybe yesterday, but that's how. So all of a sudden, oh, we're going to have the RSJ, the Real Spirit Journey is going to be Herbalist Day primarily. I'd already invited my sister to talk about the astrology of these times um, because it just seemed like everybody's interested in that after the eclipse not i don't know anybody who really felt some earth shattering eclipse change in their life or anything but <laughs> but i'm certainly happy to learn if they did and um oh let's see tara did we send a invite to jennifer tucker at all she would be another person to um it'd be fun to have I'll her i'll see if i can get in touch with her yeah good so um, let's see. Yeah. So Herbalist Day, it's to celebrate ourselves <laughs> or be celebrated by our students or people um, that are out, out, that aren't students who like us. <laughs> Those few people in the world. <laughs> so, so I guess, is there more to Herbalist Day than I'm, does anybody know any more about Herbalist Day? Any of you guys? No, no, I'm a bad shaking. Okay, it's still under development. Yeah. <laughs> I think I think Rosemary invented it. Uh, yeah, <laughs> right, right. <laughs> oh, so you guys who do not know Rosemary, um, because we're so overwhelmingly influenced by Rosemary Gladstar. So she was a young hippie girl in. Uh, she's Armenian, so she grew up like among the um, Armenian diaspora in um, in uh, California, on uh, on the road between uh, Sebastopol and um, 
um, Santa Rosa, her family had a farm there and they, they had until quite recently. It's like the last undeveloped farm there, but her parents were so old because they had a herbalist for a daughter to keep them alive. And so she grew up there and then founded a hippie herb store in the 70s in Sebastopol and um, eventually sold it and moved to Vermont and uh, bought a mountain. <laughs> and um, what is it called? Sage Mountain. Yeah, right. At least nowadays it is. And it's about 450 acres. And they also eventually arranged for the purchase of a um, piece of 100 acres or 80 acres next door that had never been logged in like 150 years, which is pretty rare in Vermont. And there's actually a story about that. But um, yeah, Hannah Hill. It's called Hannah Hill. Yeah. Okay. You've probably visited it then. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it I, was a big, it was a big UPS fundraiser that Rosemary put together. Mm -hmm. Um to purchase Hannah Hill and it's in the care of United Plant Savers. Oh, okay. Yeah. So there it was a hundred acres belonged to some ancient family that died, was slowly dying out and you'd think they'd want to preserve it, but no, the last member wanted to sell it to the logger. The logger got in line before Rosemary, although she'd had her eye on it for a long time. And the logger was, no, no, I'm not going to spare it. You know, it's like, we need, we need, money in vermont and this went on for like six months and finally rosemary blurted out but i need it for my business and then he like stopped and he said oh because he's in favor of business he wasn't just he didn't, wasn't that he just wanted to log it he wanted to generate money in rural vermont he was a real vermonter so she explained how this was going to be a nature preserve for they weren't just preserving it because you know, a bunch of rich people are going to go up there and shoot mice or something. <laughs> they wanted to preserve it for people, all, you know, all across New England, I would say, to come and see, um, you know, the original and old growth forest. So now really, actually, it's probably, there's probably less than 5,000 acres of old growth forest in Vermont. There may be less than a thousand, I don't know, because it's gotten hit so many times by lumber people so at any rate so and she taught up there and she she founded ups but we could have um susan can describe more about that but at any rate um for our whole generation so i got off track so she had her herb store she moved to vermont she set up um various herbal conferences the um one in which we had in um at wheaton college in um uh massachusetts that UPS ran last um, June and uh, June a year ago. And um, what is that called? International Herb Symposium. Well, she thought of this. I mean, this goes beyond diversity. This is like everybody in the world. Like we have people from virtually every country. It's like really amazing. And um, uh, so international. And I've met so many great people there over the years. And um she also did the women's herbal in at least the one in Massachusetts, maybe other ones too. She, I'm sure she founded the one in California, which is still going. And she must have founded many, many things. And she's written several books, The Family Herbal, highly recommended all of them. And she has a uh, introductory herb course. I don't think she has a more advanced herb course, but an introductory like first year type herb course. And she's still going along up there with her sweetheart, uh, Robert, who was a local a, a local lad right from that Wilkes Bear or from that town, and somehow they met. So it's kind of, you know, the California hippie girl meets the French Canadian uh, logger <laughs> and lives happily ever after. So so that's what I have to say about Rosemary, our founder. Of the whole generation, almost um, like I would say, uh, Phyllis is from another outside tradition, but um, but you got grafted in, so <laughs> I got accepted, right? Yeah, right, right. She <laughs> up one day and found out, oh, there's all these other herbalists all around the country. <laughs> really? Yeah, <laughs> I know. I didn't know. 
<laughs> yeah. So maybe Susan, do you want to talk about it? And we can each, each introduce ourselves, but Susan, you want to talk about um, Rosemary and UPS and so on a bit. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, um, UPS is celebrating 30 years this year, which is like a huge accomplishment. Um, I've been the executive director for 15 years now. So I guess half-life and in some capacity, but I'm the third executive director. And um, yeah, I mean, like you'd mentioned before, I won't say too much, but um, the International Herb Symposium had started several years, um, had been going for, for a few years. And she just asked a question, were people concerned about what was going on? And, um, you know, kind of brought people together who were wild crafters and growers and herb companies and herbalists. And, you know, I think, you know, kind of all the stakeholders involved and, and all those people got together and said, yeah, we're, we're kind of concerned. Let's start an organization. So that's how, um, you know, UPS got started and, uh, not long after the organization was formed, all these people got together and came up with the at-risk list. And that was really just people getting together and sitting around the table and talking about plants that they were concerned with. Um, later, Kelly Kitchard um, became a board member who is a wonderful ethnobotanist from University of Kansas and helped kind of solidify an at-risk tool, which helps identify at-risk medicinal plants. And um, the sanctuary in Ohio was purchased and uh, that's in Southern Ohio, 360 acres. And it wasn't long after the sanctuary was purchased that Rosemary was like, everybody should have a sanctuary. And that's really where the sanctuary network kind of um, spawned from. And it's, I don't know, gosh, every day it's growing. I mean, I think it's a network of, you know, getting up to 300 botanical sanctuaries across the country. And you can go online wow. and explore that. Um we're, we're really excited. We've gotten a, a pretty substantial grant to expand our facilities. So we're going to be building a, we're going to be building a new building um, that's going to have capacity for seed storage and a herbarium collection. We're expanding our library. Um, so some pretty awesome things on the horizon. And we're involved in a lot of USDA grants that are multi-stakeholders um, across the whole Appalachian region um, cultivating at-risk um, native medicinals and getting them into the hands of farmers and teaching lots of workshops. So always something going on um, and really excited about, um, I get excited every year about our journal. It's all kinds of stories from members and um, really cool projects that are happening um, around the world with medicinal plants that are all, you know, community-based projects. And so I think it's a, a feel-good journal um that's totally uplifting filled with art and poetry and um just really represents the community of plant people and um of course I'm a big fan of the Matthew Wood school <laughs> and I'm excited about you know the future of diving deeper into um you know the tradition of American herbalism in the United States. It's a beautiful thing. And um, I really hope that when the International Herb Symposium comes back to life in June of 2025, that there'll be a strong focus on the eclectics. And oh. um, that's kind of my, my, my little nugget of what I'm kind of planning at the moment. And um and so, yeah, I'm super excited to, to to hear from everybody. And thanks for inviting me at the last minute. I'm glad it worked out. <laughs> Happy well, to everybody, be here. everybody got an invitation at the last minute. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes, we all did. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. So having, I mean, Kelly Kinshaw, that's no small name um, if you are Plains um yeah. ethnobotanist um he wrote the book on plains uh kind of native american mm -hmm. herbs and as i understand it he actually did have an apprenticeship with a medicine man but he didn't publish any of that information yeah. not it was not meant for public consumption so he's a major mover shaker and that Absolutely. just shows you how um you know 
much and that that means that he's probably telling his friends about it and we're known out there and um i don't know do you guys certify plant um different companies like are you are, you don't we don't we don't necessarily certify certain companies i mean we, we encourage companies to become members and we have a list of business members and that's a great source to look at because people those companies care we do do um uh verified forest grown so oh. we we will um it's it's more of a program that just really helps provide information and knowledge to farmers who are growing woodland medicinals yeah. um, and they become part of the verified forest grown program. And then that provides transparency in the supply chain that, that goes to companies. So some companies will put the verified forest grown label on their products. Wow. Um, so that's, that's kind of one, one, one way. I also think, you know, that's the, I mean, I, you know, every plant's different. So whether it's being wildcrafted sustainably or or cultivated or grown I, I do think more and more people want to know um more specifics on sourcing these botanicals yeah. that go into their products and um so yeah yeah so and you guys finally did actually reach out some of the kind of Appalachian um wild crafters um and kind of make contact with them um, who were some of them just picking things left and right, but yeah. um, helping them to become more conscious too. Yeah, yeah. just providing really good information and 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 um, and knowledge and sharing knowledge. You know, it goes yeah. both ways. So, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So, to ask a question here, so I I happen to be more familiar with wild crafters in the West, like um, Stefan. I forgot his last name, and um, uh um new mexico um santa fe uh judy lieblin one of our teachers she's not a really a professional wildcrafter but they just comment on how wildcrafting is dying out i know stefan has like supported himself for like 25 30 years as a wildcrafter which really is a quite a skill plus mm -hmm. you gotta know a lot of ranchers out there have made personal relationships so that you can pick on on their land and stuff and actually he became kind of a bit of an herb doctor to the rural people because they said, oh, you're an herbalist, you know, and then he got a good reputation by helping them. But he just, I think um, there's hardly anybody who really wants to, um, that young people that want to take over that business or whatever. And so, and I, do you hear that too? And Yeah, I, it's, it's a global issue. Absolutely. And I think it's, it's really pushing companies to rethink their supply chain and yeah. to really build lasting relationships in communities. And, but yeah, yeah it's, it's certainly a, a global trend and, and even in Appalachia and I hear it all the time, like, and I think you're going to see it in the marketplace because uh, companies are reformulating, you know, some com some companies have come to me, well, they can't get cramp bark. It's not that cramp bark isn't out there. It's just that nobody's willing to go harvest it or they can't get fringe tree bark. You know, the, the, the sort of, you know, it's like those peripheral things that, you know, maybe someone would harvest or harvesting something else. They have knowledge about it, but um, slowly and slowly these things um, and we're going to see tincture companies kind of reduce the number of tinctures that they're making because yeah. these, these kind of, you know, little, you know, these things that are, I wouldn't say it's not that they're not common in the forest, but there's not, it's no longer common to people who know these plants yeah. and, and have yeah. the time and energy to, I mean, maybe you're seeing the same thing, Phyllis, in Alabama. Uh, yeah. Oh. And it is true that people uh, who forage or harvest um, don't know as many plants as what we used to know in the woods. So, yeah. um, especially if it's not blooming, how do you find fringe tree if it's not blooming? Well, the old time um, wild crafters exactly knew, or they would go in and mark it. You know, they had ways of marking plants and all that is dying out. People don't know. And, and also, I think the internet, um, d doctor internet, where you've got like 15 herbs, and these are the only ones that we want to use, it is kind of like taking away from a lot of our traditional uh, herbs, the use of the traditional herbs, because they're not sanctioned by doctor internet. So yeah. fringe tree ends up getting like this long list of 
possible contraindications. Oh, how about using time instead? And it has none. You, you know, so I think that's kind of happening in a way too. Yeah. Um, the internet is set, you know, kind of, I don't even know what the word. Um, Coming down. He, well, yeah, I was thinking about that, you know, <laughs> uh, gaslighting, that's yep. the word. The internet is gaslighting traditional herbal use, yep. um, the herbs we used to know. So I think your whole concept of the eclectics, that is all about the, all these herbs that people don't use it much yeah, anymore. Yeah, right. yeah. I mean, yeah. that's what it's about. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And the, the first medical college in the state of Alabama was eclectic and there is a town in Alabama named eclectic because of that and oh. it was like it it was just kind of like very influential the eclectics after yeah. the civil war yeah. were just very influential so I think that is an amazing idea yeah and we yeah. get to learn we get to teach about plants that we normally don't get to teach about yeah and also this kind of infringes upon, you know, I just always look upon the great heritage gift of the Native American plants that we carry on, um, um, both black and white herbalists both, and Native herbalists still um, are carrying on, you know, a really rich tradition, which, you know, I hate to see die out, but it, and what can you say, it's not just that it's, it's, sometimes it doesn't die out. It just gets changed and the old insights are lost. Like black co-wash, it's like they don't really get how it was used in olden times. Yeah. So, yes, uh, I guess we have a big history thing there to continue with. And 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 we are definitely doing that at the uh, Matthew Wood Institute, as you guys know. I think at yeah. least Phyllis and Carolyn have been involved in history classes. So, yeah. So, so thank you, you guys. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, I, yeah. And worldwide, I remember I talked to a woman, um, that'd be Chinese accent, um, one of the warehouses in San Francisco and, uh, and I somehow, you know, well, how's it going? Somehow it got on. She said, well, it's hard. It gets harder and harder to get these herbs because there's the young people don't want to do it. And I was kind of like, this is about 10 years ago. I was kind of like, what in China, you know? But I imagine 10 years has not made it any better. And um, and a lot of this, it dies out. with If somebody doesn't pick it up, it's going to be hard to, well, you'd almost have to go to botany, get a botany degree to make up, and you still wouldn't know what the elders knew. So it is, oh, so among our listeners today, and if this gets, gets if there are those of you who are interested in wildcrafting, um, you know, sensibly, then contact us, Susan or myself or anybody who's regional. Um, uh, uh, so um, Phyllis is in Alabama and um, Carolyn's in New York City and Nicole is down in um, at so South Carolina. And um, so it, because it is a worthy profession and to do it right, especially, I think one thing that's happening maybe, and Susan can address this again, is that a lot of the um, woodland farming that a lot of these herbs are being farmed, I think now, instead of being just wildcrafted out there, I would assume that that's going on, but still there's some loss of, of, of herbs and things. And yeah. Um, so, well, so that's kind of my main concerns in, in that direction with UPS. I mean, it's kind of funny. We would have thought, I think our main concern when Rosemary founded that 30 years ago was too much picking. And now it's kind of like sensible picking is dying out. <laughs> and yeah. it's an art and a thing that's um has its qualities. Oh, and I should say, how does this affect the forest? Very definitely when you have a forest where people value the little things as well as the big things, not just the trees, it really does improve the forest because then they don't just go in and cut everything down. I remember Adam Liebling, uh, one of William's students, describing how he found 40 acres of um, freshly cut, like red oak in Arkansas or somewhere with just tons of lady slippers mm -hmm. that were be dead in another year. 
and another person ginseng you know it's like would they really cut down a gin a forest full of ginseng if they knew what they were doing yeah so uh or again um brent davis um um phyllis knows him like he told me how there was a he found a place where there was it was like the homeland of echinacea it was like because they like um the prairies with um limestone or lime so there was seashells everywhere it was like a depression where the shells had gathered and there was just tons and tons of echinacea there for five years he and then one year he went it's all gone because they had had their helicopter go over and kill it all so that so that grass could grow for cattle and i remember also in the black hills seeing where the wheat fields went right up to the fence and then the the along the um, highway easement, there was all this nice echinacea. And really, echinacea could be more valuable than wheat. So <laughs> so we still have lots of things to do, but um, uh, but mostly it's not been um, herbalists who've been exterminating it. And if people were to appreciate these, you know, littler products that could be quite valuable again, mm -hmm. so. Yeah. 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 And I think, I think that's what makes, you know, United Plant Savers a really unique organization because most conservation organizations are like hands off. Right. But we really want hands on, but we just want it to be a very reciprocal hands on relationship, but it's so critical. Yeah. Um, and I, I think you're, you're exactly right. Maybe at that time when UPS was founded, there was a concern of, of being of wild crafters over harvesting but but now we we do we have a trend of less really knowledgeable wild crafters and it's really the loss of habitat and yeah. lack of awareness for plants it's not it's not the the impact of the herbal industry i mean i mean this is what you know i kind of get on my little soapbox is that you know i really um see herbalism as the gateway drug to activism right because <laughs> so that's my <laughs> I got to make a bumper sticker, but that's my spiel. You know, we're not, we're not here to police you or tell you what you should or shouldn't do. We're, we're, we're re we really want people to have intimate relationships with plants and you do that by harvesting them and using them. And, you know, that's not the problem, right? It's really just getting, getting people jazzed up. And once you get into herbalism, you get so turned on to plants and then you realize what's in your backyard and, and then you're going to be more active in protecting it. And maybe you're going to say something when somebody's going to clear cut that parcel yeah. in your community. And that that's what it's about. And I think UPS got a little bit of a bad rap in the beginning because Rosemary was just so emphatic about whatever, but needless to say, you know, I, I that's, you know, I think you, you've given an accurate description. So anyways, we're all yeah know, meant to be activists so <laughs> another way another something is from phyllis so phyllis had told me how she found so we would love to substitute yellow root for golden seal to the extent yeah. possible and she found it growing on the shores of lake geneva in southeastern wisconsin which is like really far north mm -hmm. wow. looking it up yeah and Everybody listed it hardy to zone five or four. So I finally, this year, I ordered three of them and I really hope to get that mm. going. Yeah. And that's just me, what I would like to use. But, but that's a plant that, it, that, that we, you harvest the above ground parts to the underground. So that's why it's better than the golden seal, mm -hmm. probably. Yeah. yeah and, the, um, the, the, so, um, the USDA has been funding, I think we're in our sixth year, it's called um, the American um, for Forest Farming, Appalachian, sorry, Appalachian Forest Farming Coalition. Okay. And yeah. um, there's a YouTube channel and there's so many great videos on, and and there is a video on how to um, uh, to grow yellow root. And, and you can literally just cut the tops off and stick them in the ground and they'll sprout. Yeah. Um, it's a very easy plant to cultivate and it's really easy to multiply really quickly. So I think you're absolutely right. You know, yellow root is a great native plant. Um, yeah. And I saw somebody make a comment about, you know, barberry harvesting invasives. That's always a good idea. Um, so yeah, there's, you know, lots, you know, anyways, some good, some good things to, um, to think about, but um, I'm, I'm cultivating yellow root here on my farm in Virginia. 
Oh, great. Um, and I think the video on the on the YouTube channel for the Appalachian Forest Farmers is um is from North Carolina. Um, let's see, Tara, maybe could you find that, dig it up and put it on the, um, the, uh, chat? Yeah, I could try, I could get it too. Yeah, Susan can do it. Yeah. Yeah. I'll give her a break. <laughs> yeah, another exciting thing I found out from Phyllis was that there's a, um, go to cola that grows into a Appalachia. Yes. Much more hardy than the one that, what do you, yeah. what um, it. I can't remember the uh, the Latin name. It is a centella, and it and it looks exactly like the Asiatic, uh, which is needs the warmer weather and grows in India and has becoming um, kind of taking over parts of the Gulf area, and it's growing wild there. But we do have a native centella um, that grows quite abundantly where I live in the woods and grows, you know, further north. Um, I'll look up the Latin on that and put that in the chat. So, you know, it was an herb that was used um, here traditionally, but I didn't realize it was a centella. I mean, I didn't realize it was a go to cola. Uh, wow. And until I, on an herb walk, somebody said, Ooh, go to cola. And I went, where, <laughs> you know, one of those, because I've never seen go to cola. And they went there, and I, I went, oh, that's centella. Or, or you know, um, and they were like, yeah, go to cola. And I went, wait, let me look at that out. You know, it was kind of a shock to me to realize that, but it was very true. So I think we have a lot more diversity than people realize. Yeah. Um, yes. Right. Well, let's see. Thank you. So let's get a report from New York City. How is herbalism there doing? And herbalists from Carolyn. Or Brooklyn, actually, I should say. <laughs> Oops. Um, voice. Yeah. Herbalism, the message of herbalism is being spread. I um, am leading quite a few community events and doing tea tastings. So um, I'm introducing the community to the various tastes of the herbs so that uh, they could get rid of the thought that it has to taste nasty. You know, you got to get past the nasty. And uh, I was talking to Susan Weed recently and mentioned to her that I use hibiscus. And by the way, she says, hi, she loves you, Matt. Uh, and um, she, I mentioned to her, I used hibiscus in my drink. She said, oh, yes, people love to drink red things. So oh. uh, <laughs> that's true. true. As soon as, and, you know, there's a heavy Caribbean population. And as soon as they see a red drink, they believe it's sorrel, which oh. hibiscus and sorrel, mm -hmm. uh, some people argue it's not the same, but everything I've read, it says it's the same thing. It's interchangeable. Is that so from your uh, knowledge? Well, both so are astringents. They're interchangeable maybe in properties kind of. Uh -huh. yeah. So, but they're different plants? Yeah, they're different family. Okay. Well, yeah. but the taste is pretty much the same. Yeah. So um, today I blended Cinnamon, nutmeg, hibiscus, comfrey, linden, and just a touch of white willow bark, just in case anybody had some aches and pains, and then uh, sweetened it with honey. And it was a hit. They were finding jars at the end of the conference and wow. getting the last dregs of it, you know? Yeah. And um, also, I'm excited to be incorporating herbs into my acupuncture sessions because you know I just recently got certified as a um, uh, acupuncture detoxification specialist mm. and uh, my goal is to introduce herbs to the participants that come to the clinic uh, for tea tastings uh, as they move into their acupuncture treatment. So that's been my focus on herbs. Yeah, and we should point out um, that Carolyn is a chaplain. And when I first met her, did we meet online or 
not in person. No, we met at Arbor Vitae. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. Mm -hmm. And but you were a chaplain and then we corresponded. Remember, remember in COVID when like all of a sudden your best friends were all online, not in your neighborhood so much. <laughs> so yeah. We know each other and um Carolyn was actually working in a mortuary, which is quite something. And maybe sometime we'll do an interview if it's not too macabre. But mm -hmm. it wouldn't be macabre. Um, okay. Yeah, I, I mentioned it even today. I mention it often because people don't realize that herbs are very uh, good for handling grief and uh, yeah. despondency. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we had a little group that met. Um, through COVID there, 2020 and 2021, good people, Deb and, and Jennifer and stuff. And um, yeah, and shared grief remedies uh, mm -hmm. through herbalism, which which mm -hmm. I'm not an expert at, but um, Deb and Carolyn really gathered quite a few. So, so that's something pretty neat, uh, unique. So we do have a class on death and dying with Carolyn, yeah. And she's working with elders now. And so hopefully one of these days we'll get an actual class on working with the elderly. Um, I would yeah. love. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, um, but I think Tara's doing interviews with various herbalists and you would be, I'd want to be included though. You would be great to interview about you about the, and mm -hmm. she wrote up a big thing. We we're never really able to get it into a book or something, but well, it, it might, I should just send it the way it is to my publisher and, see if he's interested but i mean carolyn wrote up a really incredible account of um of the life in the covid in new york city in brooklyn you know which it was harder in brooklyn wow. than it in the country it was rough. It was rough. And, yeah. and tara did interview me she interviewed me but it would be nice to uh do an interview about uh working with seniors in the future yeah right right well, so we are joined by Sean here in a yurt. For those of you who don't know what that background would be. Okay. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I forget, but that to me, that always, I just always think of teaching at Rosemary's because she had a yurt. Probably yeah. still. Yeah. And that was always, that's where I first got exposed to that sort of background. Yeah. Yeah. Love yurts. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, let's see. Let's try Nicole here, um, or Amanda. I forgot what name or, okay, <laughs> from South Carolina. Where in South Carolina? I'm right near Clemson University, so Greenville, South Carolina, maybe 40, 45 minutes from the Western North Carolina border, which I like to move towards often because <laughs> it's really quite a different to feel in the upstate of South Carolina when it comes to plants. I grew yeah. up in East Tennessee and lived for a while, actually near Susan, uh, around Charlottesville, Virginia. So the upstate of South Carolina is a little different. <laughs> There's different plant friends here. Yeah, That's where I'm at. And you probably do wildcraft up in the mountains some. Yeah. Yes, you can here, especially um, being so close to the mountains and, and then just this area in general, but that was an interesting conversation for me to listen to <laughs> because um, like Susan said, the loss of habitat, but also in my experience, and I don't know if you guys want to go back to this conversation, but I'll just note it, the laws that are in place, you know, so on certain lands, you can't because they're wanting to preserve it. But even in the town that I live in, just this little tiny town, I mean, you can literally just drive through it in two minutes. <laughs> um, it's actually, I'm not making this up. I learned this last summer, a thousand dollars a day fine in my town. If you have any vegetation in your yard on your land, that is over eight inches tall. So I learned that last summer because I moved into town. I have been li living like on the outskirts, um, uh, on the edges. <laughs> and then I, I moved into town to make things a little easier. 
but this isn't like not to speak poorly of Liberty, South Carolina, but it's not, you know, it's not any big deal. It's okay here, you know, but these are left over from, it's interesting. If you look at the law that's on the books, they actually list eight or nine particular plants that they call pernicious weeds. Mm. And I didn't actually recognize the names of any of them. I could be wrong about this, but I wondered if it was some sort of like herbal moonshine they were trying to avoid, <laughs> you know, and also just this idea of how do things look like we want to, we want to look better, you know, than maybe we are because this is a little mill town and it's a very poor area. And these are old laws on the books. And so anyway, I think that's part of it too, because my space here, the land that I live on, it's beautiful. There's so much on it. <laughs> and it's a very small amount of land, but it's just thriving. But it wouldn't be thriving if I obeyed. So, so I've been working on that with the city because, you know, when we have those sorts of laws in place, you know, people can't value the plants. They can't learn their names. They don't even know things like violet or cleavers exist, much less when you guys are talking about these other plants, you know, because everything is just grass, <laughs> you know. Or weight. Right. And it just needs to be, um, it just needs to be cut down for our own convenience. Even in the law, it said any plant that like, this is bizarre to me, that spreads pollen, I'm like, who makes these laws? Like, who, what? No one should be making these laws that doesn't know something about plants. So I feel this little bit in me that needs to rouse up to engage on a, a wider scale than just my particular place. But, you know, there's a lot, there's a lot going on. Anyway, that was a little side note that there's actually a lot going on out there. A lot of different facets to, um, how people are being affected by this harvesting because you can't even really do it on your own land in some places when you have that type of law in place and in places where people are so poor to have a thousand dollars a day fine that could literally destroy you that's how much you know some people here make in a couple of weeks you know mm -hmm. nobody's going to chance it anyway that was a little side note <laughs> since you asked where I was and how things are going. I do want to say one thing, though, too, about Rosemary Gladstar. It was actually her herbal class when it was um, when it was course a correspondence class. So now everything's online, but this was correspondence. You did your work, you turned it in. Before Matt, before I went to Teresa's class in Virginia at Green Comfort, and before I met you, I signed up for Rosemary's class, the Sage Mountain Correspondence course. And maybe this will help somebody feel good. <laughs> I didn't finish it. I didn't even get past the first question. Golly. I remember the first plant. The first plant in her book was Mullen. And Mullen has stuck with me. And I, I've loved it. And, and I continued on. And I found you and Teresa. But the first question was, tell us about yourself. <laughs> and at the time, I couldn't do that. I, I couldn't do it. I didn't know. What, I kept giving myself all the labels everybody had given me. I, I actually have a picture somewhere of this pile of paper that I kept wadding up and throwing because I couldn't couldn't answer the question. And now all these years later, the plants that are dear to me and what I do teach and what I do offer is very much that question. <laughs> Who are you? Why are you here? Yeah. So, you know, it's okay to fail. <laughs> It's okay not to answer the question or finish it, you know. Oh. The time will come. Yeah. Huh. Well, well, uh, uh hey, let's see. That's where you're living. Anything special you're doing in the herbal world? In herbalism? Well, I hope you're not bored when I say this because I'm gonna say what I usually say. <laughs> I'm I'm working with Tula Poplar. That's what yeah. I usually say. Yeah, but I just finished writing um a book about it, about it's medicine and and how it's interwoven over just over a decade together more in our life together so I've just finished that and I'm um that's what I'm primarily still working with is the spirit of the plants and and writing and that sort of thing I'm not doing very many in-person 
classes at the moment. Um, we're doing a writing course right now <laughs> that's on Tulip Poplar as a writing tree and how it helps us to find our voice and move through blocks with writing. So those are those are more of the ways that I'm engaging at the moment. Oh, wow. Yeah, well, Nicole certainly has always been a unique herbalist. <laughs> <laughs> What else can you say? <laughs> and any, just a short report from your, I must be in touch with another unique herbalist down there. Robin McGee, have you seen her of late? I haven't seen Robin in a while and I, I miss her. And, you know, Robin is a very lovely example of what you guys were speaking about earlier of foraging and wild crafting, you know, with her land there and her farm. It's such a gift to this area to go and to gather I don't know how many times I've needed something and called up Robin. She's like, come on over, Amanda. <laughs> we just start, you know, walking and going. That's happened several, several times. But I haven't, I haven't got to visit with her in a while. But I'm, I'm grateful she's here and that she is someone who's continuing those traditions for us here. Yeah, actually, note to Tara, let's interview Robin McGee, even if you haven't met her, like one important thing is her husband probably runs the best uh, line of cattle that's um, range fed. Very important, um, well established herd that goes back a long time. So that's there's two reasons to to interview them down there. So and she's such a character. She really is. <laughs> She'll have well, some good stories and good ways of. Yeah. Uh, talking and being when I moved here she really took me in when I moved here from Virginia I was so glad to have her well yeah she talks to the plants and the animals yeah <laughs> I think she made a deal with the hawks not to eat her chickens <laughs> she probably makes the deal with a lot of things <laughs> she ran into a Oh, there was a copperhead that came up towards the house and she said, now you stay away or um, what's her husband's name? Matt, Max, Matt, um, Mac. Yeah. Yeah. Mac. We'll have to, yeah. Mac. we'll have to get rid of you, you know, and it was only a year or two later, the snake came up to the house, was right in the yard mm -hmm. and she talked to it and said, what did I tell you? And, and the snake said, well, I came up here to die. So mm -hmm left it for a couple hours and it died very interesting uh how oh. hi there's my sister mina wood yeah in her home i believe yeah uh let's see you're you're muted i think yes i was muted thank you hi i made it i'm so happy to be here yeah well as you it might have been explained to you this turned out to be herbalist day and so we're going through herbalists, but we want to hear some about the astrology of the now because it's such intense, crazy times. And we just did have the eclipse and you actually are, I don't know if anybody else, maybe some of you guys live close enough to have attended. So she, yeah, uh, um, up in Maine. Um, okay. So Sean did too. Yeah. And Mina was visiting a friend out in Detroit. So she was able to make it over there. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Let's finish. We'll finish uh, accounts from herbalists here, and then we can talk with Mina some. And Mina certainly is familiar, lifetime familiarity with herbs and homeopathy because um, mom and dad always practiced homeopathy. Well, my dad a little bit more. So she was always hearing, you know, oh, you should be doing this or that, I think, <laughs> from uh, any message. And actually, and your kids were helped at different times with uh with um, herbs. Of course, she and her husband are pretty healthy, so I don't know how many times they've needed herbs, but but kids always need herbs. So, But Phyllis, how are you doing? <laughs> I am doing well, thank you. Um, I'm staying busy, and it's, uh, you know, the, the plants are bursting at the seams right now here in the South, so been spending some time next door, and uh, Amanda Nicole, my city small town matthew knows how small it is two blocks um yeah. has a similar law on the books about how high the weeds can be in your yard and i just put up a wooden fence <laughs> problem solved right i just put up a privacy fence and it can be as tacky as i want it to be behind the privacy fence but i have you know like a, a mowed area on the street side i've been very tacky 
I think you might be proud. So the town that I live in, uh, it's it's an old mill town, and I don't I can't afford to put up a fence, and I don't really want to. I sort of like the openness of the space. So I just think it sounds so bad. No one's going to want to come visit me. I put up a clothesline, and I have beautiful vintage sheets. And they're mm. just up and I've weighted them and they kind of billow in the air. And I thought, you know, it fits. I look, I did check the books to make sure we could still put up clotheslines though. But it was, it's a visual, just something to wear, you know, out of sight, out of mind is my, That's right. is my hope. Yeah. But now I think yeah. I fit in with my sheets. <laughs> well, I've got to say, Phyllis, whoever owned that, you can't really call it that what that terrible woods behind you that you probably own nowadays yeah. well 75 years ago they must have let that grow bigger than eight inches because that's about the weeest forest i've ever seen yes it <laughs> but it's but it has been changing so there was a lot of black locust in this little copse of land yeah. and black locust has a kind of short life and then it kind of dies and falls to the ground and then there's an open space where it was and so something i noticed last year is now i have like the biggest patch of poke you have ever seen in your whole life because it seems like that everywhere a little sunshine came in and a tree kind of fell over 15 poke plants came in so it's turning into a pokeberry forest back there oh. once you get in it <laughs> it's really kind of neat i didn't realize that uh, black locust was that limited in its lifespan is there kind of a limit how big they get and they just don't get I, well they just you know they're not a real long-lived tree and i can't tell you maybe 30 years or, or maybe 40 years something like that as a opposed to like the oak tree in in the house I grew up in um yeah. wow. you know when the arborist came and guesstimated it they guesstimated it was about 450 years old yeah. right um but the uh black locust is it just didn't it just doesn't have that longevity um and they die really easy um from the elements or drought you know if there's a dry spell it's one of the trees that goes and um bugs don't get it you know and, and farmers used to grow black locust just for fence post yeah right yeah. um because it's a super got a natural yes. parasite um bug killing property to it but they fall over really they just die and fall over and it just it opens up a lot of space in that tiny bit of woods that i have um in that tiny bit of woods some bamboo is beginning to take over a bit um and it's actually the privet is kind of being pushed out yeah. got, yes i don't know um, the Everybody else is as interested as I am in, in in your woods back there, but it was so terribly weedy. It was like, what in the world? I, I mean, know. Literally, if you, even with a chainsaw, you probably couldn't have gotten more than three feet into that woods. <laughs> no, <laughs> no. Uh, vinca came in from nowhere. Where did this vinca come in from? And suddenly it's starting to kind of take over. Let me see what else has come in since you were here. Oh, Cherokee Rose came in. Um, made a very pretty hedge at the very front of that little bit of woods. Um, mm. Very protective. Some blackberries came in. So I'm just kind of, you know, waiting to see what what changes happen on this little tiny bit of wild land. But it's full of birds, uh, oh. full of birds. You oh. just can sit and listen to the birds. Amazing. Mm. There is a red-shouldered hawk that's living back there right now. Um, so I watch it. Um, they're kind of unique hawks um, to see. They're kind of short, fat hawks with a red shoulder. <laughs> oh. Oh. Well. Um, they're not sleek like a red tail hawk. Um, so anyway, I've been watching the wildlife in my tiny bit of weedy woods back there. And it's very brimming. There's raccoons and um, skunks and uh, fox and um lots of rabbits and of course squirrels everywhere but yeah. um this and possums i this i did just think i just realized i've been in upstate new york where the well i've seen locusts that were like several feet wide so evidently it's probably you're at the southern range 
So they're the end of the range. Yeah, they they don't they don't get very big around. They're like really tall, skinny trees here. Yeah, they're grown. They picked a cultivar that grew tall and skinny just for the fence posts. Yeah, probably. Yeah. So it's not probably. I know about that because that was from my ancestor's hometown, Hempstead. Okay. Lock. Discovered that. Yeah. yeah it messed. And Rosemary Gladstar came to visit me once. Speaking of Rosemary, and and the black locusts um, were taller than all the other trees. And I've I've got a really pretty giant mimosa tree that I do want to kind of clear around back there. But they're taller than all the other trees. They're taller than the pecan tree that's back there. But but they were sticking up, and they were obviously dead. And Rosemary would sit, and she would say. What killed all those trees? And I'll go, they just have a short life. They die. Um, but it did look really strange to see all this green and then like six to 10 feet of dead trees sticking up above that. Well, most of those have just fallen over and wherever they fall, I let them stay. Yeah. Because now they're supporting different life in the woods. So I'll actually do that. Um, yeah. Uh, any interesting things going on in herbalism in Alabama? Um, yes, we have the um, conference coming up in May that you're going to be at. So advert blatant advertisement, folks. Um, the uh, Wild Medicine Conference, May 31st through June the 2nd in Alabama. Please come. It's going to be great. Um, Matthew Wood, David Winston, and myself are kind of headlining. Um, here, what we have is um, Tommy Bass, even though he's been dead since 1996, um, he is still like the, um, what everybody aspires to here. I mean, his name still has great weight and um, his teachings still have great weight. So he is... I mentioned often so that he's still an important influence, even though, gosh, look how long that's been, 25 years or so. Um, so that's going on and foraging communities are huge. Um, oh. There is a movement underway and I'm going to find a guy's YouTube video of he's made a whole kind of uh, philosophy about businesses because most of Alabama is really rural uh, very rural but what grows by the drainage ditches at businesses <laughs> you know these are the new ec ecosystems or how do you save this one little field that has these unique plants in it so I'll post his um, YouTube channel here shortly and he's just really uh, a political activist and very phenomenal and he's really got a lot of people uh, looking at kind of land in a different way um, as a matter of fact I last fall I made with my phone I made a whole little video of what is growing here at the drainage ditch of the dollar store going to my brother's house and so just in this like you know, this area, um, wh which they created to drain off the land by the dollar store. I found bone set. I oh. found um, the really good uh, smart weed with white flower, the really, really hot one. Um, you know, I found uh, Joe Pye weed. I found, so, you know, plants have adapted. So he does a lot of good videos and how plants have adapted to this new terrain yeah. of what it is now. Um, so there's a lot of stuff going on in Alabama, actually. Um, people are, are totally into co conservation of plants and really work hard, uh, oddly, uh, you wouldn't think so, but trying to find uh, ways to buy land to save it, to save the plants on it. Oh. So lots of stuff going on here. Yeah. And what's it, um, were you talking about the guy who has the Instagram? Is it native habitat? Yes. Native That's habitats. It. He yeah, is so cool. He's so cool. And, um, native I, habitats, Instagram. He, That's right. Yeah. And, um, He's just doing phenomenal work educating people about 
native plants and prairie plants and how diverse the ecosystems are in Alabama. And yeah, he's really one of my new favorite. Yes. <laughs> my too. Yeah. yeah. And we tried that's to get what him. I thought you were talking about. Yeah. Native habitats. That's him. Yeah. Um, yes. Really good. Really good. So we were trying, tried to get him to come to our conference in May, but he couldn't. So he's going to come next year and talk about his work. Um, you know, educating people about the plants that have, and he's not an herbalist. He's just a plant enthusiast. All right. Yeah. Native habitats. Y'all look that up. Mm -hmm. Well, let's see, Sean, how are you doing in Maine? Where in Maine are you again? And uh... I'm in, I'm in Western Maine. So in some ways it's kind of Northern Appalachia. Uh, oh, yeah. It's that same Granite right. spine that goes down into Appalachia and then goes across the ocean and comes up as the hills of Ireland and then the mountains of Snowdonia and the highlands of Scotland and then up into the mountains of Scandinavia. So it's all, and you can feel it, like it's all that same stone and uh, there's something that happens along that same stone spine. <laughs> wow, yeah. Uh, and what's the town you live in? Uh, North Anson. Oh, okay. yeah, that does sound pretty small too. <laughs> yep, used to be in Rangeley, uh, where right. Wilhelm Reich was, but moved a little bit south. Yeah, yeah. I um, f there was just something on um, Wilhelm Reich on the radio about three, four days ago. How the so he was there. Nobody knew about him. I guess he'd moved from Europe. He was just in obscurity, and it was 1949, and. He was experimenting with a teeny little piece of um, radioactive material, and yeah. three years later, the FBI showed up at his doorstep, and he was on the government radar from that point on. They said, well, there's uh, radiation that showed up in the three miles surrounding your house, and your house is at the middle of it. What are you doing? <laughs> yeah. Well, it's sad irony, because he escaped the Nazis, yeah. and then he got kicked out of the Communist Party for being too anti-fascist. <laughs> and had to leave Scandinavia, and then he uh, ended up it ended up being the FDA putting him in federal prison that yeah, get we... him in again here. <laughs> yep, right. Wow. Yeah. Um, who was that? Oh, my friend David. Ah, well, we're gonna have a class on the cerebral spinal fluid, and he had found an unbelievable quotation from Wil Wilhelm Reich. Oh, that's all. That came out maybe uh, the, before Congress in 1949 or 50, when they still respected him, I guess you'd say, mm. scientist. And uh, um, yeah, it, something on the orgone and the vital force and all that. Yeah, so that will come up uh, in our class whenever that is. I, I think we have it planned. For, actually, that's the class we're going to do on, on May 1st. Sean and I are going to do a, a May Day class before or after May Day. And um, uh we didn't maybe get on it quick enough and that's his day off anyway. So yeah, holiday. So, so what's up in Maine then herbal wise? Well, um, in terms of the plants themselves, we're just like a week and a half out of the snow. We had a two foot snowstorm uh, a few weeks ago. And now we're, now we're up into the high fifties and low sixties and the, Colt's foot is up. Oh. Uh, the first leaves of the mullein are up. Mm. And uh, the catkins are on the alders. And so that will be my first harvest, going out to harvest the old alder catkins probably tomorrow. Medicine I've really been falling in love with in recent years. So tell us about that. That's new. Uh, you maybe learned about that from Kiva Rose. I did. Yeah, I learned about it from Kiva Rose. And I learned about it when I was living north of here um, when I was in Rain Clare, it was right on the lakeside. So there was even more alder there than there is here. But there's a little bit of water where I am, on, on the land where I am, so there's alder here too. And um, when I was recovering from acute COVID, uh, was right about this time of year, and went down and began picking the catkins and tincturing them. Um, but I also was just eating the catkins fresh at that time and find them to be a really, really profound 
gentle lymphatic medicines. Like Alder has a re has a reputation for being a harder medicine because people are used to the bark, and the bark can have that whole cathartic effect. But the catkins, both male and female, and the leaves are a much gentler medicine. And at the same time that they're helping with that lymphatic movement, which makes sense as we can think about how they have their roots down in the water. Uh, they also help to address inflammation, which you can see, like if you come across an alder that a bear has scratched, you'll see that where the bear scratched it, it turns red. And so you're going to want to work with alder for those kinds of situations as well, where there's something that's turning red and irritated, maybe even moving towards infection. You're getting both the bringing down the inflammation and that great lymphatic clear. And so it's been a medicine I've really been falling in love with. And then in Irish tradition, uh, it's one of those liminal medicines. It's um, in both Ireland and Scotland, uh, the alders were the places where um, lovers would run off to hide when they weren't approved of by their communities, but they also were the hiding places of warriors. And it was the elder, the uh, the die from alder that made Robin Hood's cloak green in England. Uh, so, and then among the Sami, alder is associated with the bear man, who is the wild man of the forest. So, become this medicine that's been that I've been making a deeper and deeper relationship with, and finding more and more that so many of the plants we have growing on this part of the stone spine are the same plants that were growing on my ancestors' part of the stone spine and making those connections. Wow. Nice. Yeah, well, and I guess... Oh, go ahead. Oh, you can talk, yeah. And I guess people-wise, um, I'm mostly a hermit. I usually only leave, leave my little town a couple times a year, but one of those times of year will be in Portland, Maine, and March, yeah. when you'll be there as well, when we're having Maine Fungi Fest, and Mar uh, Matthew will be teaching about um, about um, cancer and can uh, cancer and mushrooms. Yeah, well, and I'll be teaching and mushrooms. Yeah. Oh yeah, and I'll be teaching about psilocybin and the ecology of consciousness. When is that again? That is. Um, March. The weekend of May uh, of May seventeenth or twelfth, eighteenth, nineteenth. Oh, okay, that could be it too. Yeah, <laughs> I gotta work on this, get my tickets, and get everything straightened out. Because I'll be out at Margie Flint's too, and I'll be teaching that Sunday at Margie Flint's. But on Saturday, I'm teaching at the Portland Mushroom thing. I really wanted to meet more mushroom people, and um. Uh, I'm, I've never taught on cancer ever, but after all these years, I've had enough experiences with red clover, of course, um, oak, um, uh, actually chaga, the only mushroom I've used for cancer. And although I have not used, uh, herb Robert for, for cancer, it's so well, it's really an extraordinary plant, uh, according to various different sources and I've used it some, so so I wanted to just kind of begin, for me, it's a beginning uh, to talk about the, um, cancer. I didn't want to teach, really, I didn't even, I felt like I didn't understand cancer, and now I realize why, because nobody else did. Mm, yeah, uh, You got to understand the matrix, and you got to understand the immune system pretty darn well to actually know the mechanics at all. And then, uh, otherwise, it's experiential. It's like what herbs have worked there and my experience is mostly experiential but it's beginning to fill in with um different ideas about um about how the herbs work and whatnot and so i'm offering this class more as a stab i want to say in the dark in the in the twilight um to to get the dialogue going on cancer more now a lot of yeah the mushroom people do use um turkey tail and chaga for for cancer a great deal um and maybe somebody in the audience will fill us in on which which what i'd like to know is which ki kinds of cancers go with which herbs and mushrooms so so there's a little so i will be teaching on that and uh, portland maine 
not Portland, Oregon, (laughs) where there must also be a great mushroom community. (laughs) Yes. So do you have a practice at all there in the middle of nowhere or online? I do. It's mostly online. Yeah. I, um, so yeah, I do consultations with people, um, mostly by zoom and by phone, um, and get, you know, the full range of like most, very often I get the unusual spiritual and emotional questions, but I also get a fair amount of people navigating physical illnesses and especially I've been doing a lot with long and medium COVID in recent years and then I have my online teaching every Sunday night through our other world well hedge school the hedge schools were the schools that kept that kept Irish culture alive when Irish culture was outlawed and so I decided to adopt that moniker for my teaching and we spiral through different different topics related to herbalism and animism and Irish tradition and a fair amount of a fair number of classes on what um, most people call psychedelics but I like uh, what Stephen Buehner was calling them toward the end of his life the elders of the earth uh-huh. and that reminder that they were here teaching other beings long before they were teaching us. And it's all part of coming back into that communication. Yeah. There's more of a continuum also between visionary plants that aren't hallucinogenic or psychedelic and ones that are. Yeah. Yeah. How you tune in, as we all know, teach into the chorus here. Yeah. Well, let's see. Okay. Um, I have a question for Sean. Yeah. Um, how does mushroom work as a poultice? Oh, I've never worked with a topically, so I don't know. Mm-hmm. That's a good question. I'm asking that because I have a neighbor who is terminal. She mm. has vulva cancer. Ooh. And, um, I had asked her daughter if, uh, you know, she had pain. And, uh, she said sometimes, and, um, there's no open wounds or anything. It's a, a tumor. Yeah. A large tumor. And so um, I prepared an herbal formula for her mm-hmm. that included uh, rolled oats as well. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, off the top of my head, plantain leaf, self heal, some yarrow, and uh, some other things. Um, and uh, she used it as a poultice. And it oh white I put white willow bark in it as well, and it um relieved her of the pain. So as you were speaking, then it's what made me wonder if mushroom could be a good poultice. So some of the the like hard mushrooms Mushrooms. like turkey tail and reishi in powdered form. I know Margie Flint has worked with as poultices, and when I had a small skin cancer um i was i had a cream infused with with a seven mushroom powder that felt like was helpful Mm -hmm. so one of those um like mushroom harvest and mushroom science and fungi perfecti all have like seven mushroom powders or 14 mushroom powders and those powders can go very nicely into an oil or cream Mm -hmm. and that might be beneficial topically it wouldn't so much address the pain but it would help possibly with slowing some of the inflammation involved with the cancer Mm -hmm. okay thank you matt do you mind if we address a few herbal questions before before we move to astrology oh you're muted you can nod your head Okay, <laughs> I figured. <laughs> uh, so first of all, Carolyn answered a question in the chat beautifully, so I will just read it out loud. Hector says, Carolyn, living in a big city, what are the ways that you connect to plants and nature without necessarily going to a park every day? I live in Mexico City and I'm trying to appreciate and connect with the weedy plants that sprout in the sidewalk. Can you rec- What can you c- recommend? Carolyn says, hi, Hector, I was just running 
that through my mind as I was listening to these herbalists who live in the midst of greenery as a lifestyle. I visit botanic gardens and enjoy parks. I also participate in plant walks when I can. Because most of my friends are herbalists or plant lovers, I am surrounded. I am also a flower essence practitioner and aromatherapist, so I enjoy plants in their various forms. Travel gives me an opportunity to appreciate different spe species of plants as well. Great question. Is there anything you'd like to add to that, Carolyn? You don't have to, but uh, you're yes. muted again. I really don't know the layout in Mexico City, but I'm going to... I'm going to be honest with you. I took a lot of pictures of flowers uh, as I was passing apartment buildings this week, you know, and I always put a post beauty in Brooklyn or I see a beautiful tree uh, blooming in Manhattan, be beauty in Manhattan, just to show people that with a certain amount of mindfulness and focus, you can find plant beauty in, you know, the concrete jungle. You know, and sometimes you do have to enjoy the plant that has escaped through the cracks of the concrete, you know. So I'm saying, you know, get it where you can. Mm -hmm. There are a couple books out there, too. If you search urban herbalist or herbalism in the cities, um, there are a few resources that I've heard about. I haven't read them, but I, I know that there are a few. Um, this also must be said out loud as well. Early on in the talk, Frank chimes in. I genuinely hope these instructors realize the true extent of their outreach and how many people they are indirectly, how many people they indirectly affect through their teachings, not just their students. It's a phenomenal impact. So that's from Frank. Oh, and then thank, we have, thank you, Frank. We have one more question here. Anna asks, Sean, do you collect the catkins before they drop the seed or after the seed seeds fall down? Let's see. I actually find that, um, so I've, I, I love collecting them best when, uh, like, right, like right this time of year when they're emerging. I feel like there's most life in them then. But even in winter, I've taken some of the the female catkins, the ones that look, look like little uh, pine cones from the trees, and found that they can still be a pretty effective medicine in a pinch, even in the middle of winter. Oh. Yeah, well, we all want to be more educated on el uh, alder, um, and I would say well, we will, I think that's one that you'd already discussed Gust, we might talk about in the May Day um, class, which may not be right on May Day, but um, sometime around there. Obviously, we'll talk about Hawthorne, but we had other magical. The three sacred trees of Wales are the Elder, the Hawthorne, and the Rowan. We already did a class, Sean and I, where we discussed the Rowan. It's not a very major medicinal herb, but but uh, you suggested then Alder and a few other kind of um, of the uh, um trees of yeah liminal trees of of the celtic uh, background um yeah. so in fact actually this is more of a european um subject matter i don't know about native american um interest in uh, may day um i mean in that time of time period it's very british isles that's for sure <laughs> so yeah and to some extent there's some there is some scandinavian involvement although most of the things that would happen in Ireland at the, first, at the beginning of May would be happening in Scandinavia uh, midsummer, uh, but there is some some more northern uh, association there. But yes, alder is very associated with Beltane in Ireland because one of the signs that the season is upon us is when the blackbirds are singing in the alder trees. Uh, yeah, so it's either a bear medicine or a blackbird medicine, huh? Yeah, and um, uh, both, uh, both, I think they are. Uh, there's some interesting connections between blackbirds and bears. Okay. Uh, uh, well, we will be talking about these things later on. So finally, yeah. we're getting, I think, to uh, astrology time. My sister, <laughs> Mona, 
I'm sorry to interrupt, but I just want to let people know how they can find out about your upcoming class. Um, go to the Matthew Wood Institute of Herbalism, make sure to sign up for the newsletter and you'll be informed of this. Uh, we have a free class tomorrow coming up, Bitter Herbs. You and Phyllis are teaching Bitter Herbs. And also we will be announcing our new scholarship program on Monday, Earth Day. Monday is Earth Day, everybody. So we have Herbalist Day today, and then we have Earth Day on Monday. And we, um, lots of new stuff coming. We actually have a new site launching and a grand reopening coming up here soon. So make sure to go to the Matthew Wood Institute of Herbalism and sign up for the newsletter so you get to hear about all the amazing stuff coming up. All right, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. So finally, Mina was the original guest um, before I realized, before I found out that it was Herbalist's Day. And uh, because she and I were talking at the dinner table with mom here um, uh, on Sunday, and um, she just brought up so many interesting things about the astrology of the now. And actually with the solar eclipse, I don't know anybody who actually felt their life changed or the world was shifted by the solar eclipse yet. But but um, maybe some of you guys can report on that. But um, I think anybody who had a solar eclipse and then had an earthquake in their backyard, that would be quite the, <laughs> quite the experience. Oh, in fact, Carolyn, did you have did you feel that earthquake at all? in brooklyn yes i did um i was sitting on the edge of my bed and i was telling uh tara and them earlier that uh you know i have an adjustable mattress so i said maybe i pressed the button and i looked over i said but wait a minute the mattress goes like this it doesn't go like this and uh you know like this terrific fear just went in my stomach because I had never, we've had earthquakes in Brooklyn before, but I never felt it. And um, it was a, a whole shifting. And of course, the fear of maybe the building collapsing, you know, went through my mind and stuff. So what made me comfortable was to get ready to go outside so I could see what the world was doing, you know. And when I, I didn't see the world in a chaos uh, end of the world look. I was like, all right. But I just stayed outside <laughs> the rest of the day and had lunch with a friend and, you know, just did things that took my mind off of it and what? felt an aftershock around five again. There were 25, wow. but the aftershock wasn't, it just came a little bit, but we were all on edge a bit, you know, like, okay, what is really going to happen here today? <laughs> Thank goodness it, you know, went on its merry way. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Worked itself out. Worked its tension out. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, let's see. So Mina, my sister here, she actually was visiting a friend near Detroit. And um, therefore, she was able to work her way over to see the eclipse. It looks like Sean also was right on the spot where the eclipse hit. So a little bit later. So what was that like going out looking for for the eclipse? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was, oh, kind of, um, but it was a little interesting, kind of the way you guys worked it out. Uh, yeah, you know, it's interesting hearing Sean talking about his Irish history. Am I right, Sean? Um, because we stopped at a number of stops and it was all um, our Irish friends and relatives who were talking about different family systems and some of the damage, some of the generational trauma, actually. It was just so interesting kind of hopping from um, my son Dan's grandmother's house to hear the Daniel Patrick Parkinson saga of five generations of Daniel Patrick Parkinson's to Chicago to hear my friend, one of my friends, uh, Bob Cotter's lineage and his history, and then to my friend Zachary Lapointe, who's in ac acupuncture, but also from... Irish background and um, some Irish and um, Chiron is a great healer um, and Chiron, the planet was directly in the center of the eclipse. The sun and moon and Chiron were all completely aligned at the new moon on, on April 8th. And Chiron is a healer of generational trauma is what I've just been learning. So um, also a revealer. So, uh, it was just 
coincidental that this kept happening as we, every place we would stop, we would hear these stories and then kind of compare the stories to the last stop and, and kind of understand even more. Um, you know, I, myself and my brother, Matthew, we grew up in a really special home, which actually Matthew is sitting right next to the fireplace right now. Um, yeah, with a lot of uh, gentleness, kindness. Um, my father's family is a Qu are Quakers. My mother's family of Jewish descent, but peacemakers, um, anti-war. And I never even realized until I left home, really, that it was such a peaceful place because you can't see the forest for the trees when you're there. So um, I feel very fortunate that in that contemplative silence that we had so much at our house, that um, that so much we were so nurtured to you know learn. Um, Matthew, of course, was a great teacher for me, as well as both my parents. So he's twelve years old, eleven and a half years older. So um, yeah, it was it was a great journey. Um, we went to from Minneapolis. We hopped to Madison, to Chicago, uh, to Ann Arbor, and then we went south to uh, Ohio. And we were in a very small graveyard to see the eclipse. And there was a family there that were on their grandmother's grave to watch the eclipse. And um, since since then, I wanted to know more about Chiron and I have been researching, of course, the, the image of Chiron from mythology is of the centaur, the um, wounded healer. He's a kind and good centaur that um, schooled all the heroes. But eventually, I believe, and someone can correct me if I'm wrong, uh, he was injured by one of the heads of Hydra when Hercules was defeating one of the monsters. Uh, Chiron was poisoned, and then um, he was immortal, so he couldn't die. And so he spent um, a long, long, long time trying to figure out how to heal. And here he had been the teacher who had taught all these people, but... Uh, he was very kind, but he couldn't heal himself. Yeah. Um, I think that's a very important message for us all, um, herbalists who are healers. I'm a teacher myself, and I work with young people. Um, so I've been working as an art teacher in the Minneapolis schools for uh, um, about 20 years. Um, and young people are in desperate need of healing at this moment, um, and like many of us. We've gone through so much, right, in the last few years. Um, so uh, this this eclipse was actually, it's a um, the first, you know, Aries uh, is the first sign of the Zodiac. And this was the first new moon of the year. Hi, Mom. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and uh, so it's a great beginning. And, uh, and um, it's a great moment to plant seeds for the future. So a great time to set intentions, the first sign of the Zodiac, the first new moon, and with all this uh, healing Chiron energy um, to really uh, see how we can impact the greater, the greater collective and also maybe heal some of those ancestral wounds that, um, that have been unattended to. So um, I would love to, I, I have lots more to say, but I'd love to hear if anyone has any questions. Yeah, that, that's wonderful. Yeah, wow, very timely. Yes, any comments there? I don't have any questions, but I have a comment because you kind of, something you said really kind of struck me. Normally I don't like eclipses. <laughs> I stay indoors, it's kind of like this, Mm -hmm. thing of eclipse energy is so yucky and I don't want to be out in it and where I'm at we had about 80 percent eclipse it wasn't wait 88 percent it wasn't 100 but 88 quite a bit um and so the last one 2017 I didn't get off my porch I just kind of watched it <laughs> out there I didn't want to be in the energy this time I went for a walk. I was like, I need to be in this energy. And I didn't know why. And I hadn't looked it up. But you just did, you know, what you just shared totally explained. It's like, yeah. it was a healing eclipse and was 
the energy was very healing and on some level I felt that because I just wanted to be out in it and I walked for like an hour over an hour just out in that energy so thanks for clearing that up I had still been puzzling about my change of heart about eclipse energy <laughs> thanks <laughs> it, there's many cultures that believe you should stay inside during an eclipse Mm -hmm. um, that's what and, I was taught. <laughs> All right. And I've had a very, very difficult last four years. And so I was also very concerned that um, I might make a misstep during the eclipse, actually, you know, um, you know, drive my car too fast and you know, whatever, just make some mm -hmm. misstep. So I had yeah. to really watch myself and I was very intentional um, because I was like, you know, the last four years have been so hard that I just don't, I, I've got, I've got to stay clear. I've got to stay clear on this. I've yeah. got to focus on healing and uh, aligning my will with the universal will, you know, and trying to like bring forward, bring peace and happiness and justice forward, even though we're living in a world that's very conflicted and very painful. Right. You know, and, um, I live right in the heart of Minneapolis. I live very close to, um, I live in Powderhorn Park and very close to the, the site of the murder of George Floyd. And um, I watched my own city, Lake Street, burning from my porch and, you know, the the, the police station and all that was right here. So um, there's been a real rake, reckoning in my, right in my backyard. And um, and at the same time, when I was hearing everyone talking about herbalism, this is a neighborhood. It's a funky neighborhood. Uh, there's no rules about mowing your lawn here. You can grow as many weeds as you want. And it's very typical to walk down the street and there's just pollinator plants and sunflowers and stuff everywhere in the boulevards because people are, are free thinkers here. But um, there was... Uh, there's been like a real reckoning in the last four years. And especially me as a middle-class white person, it, it, I mean, it's a very diverse neighborhood, but I had a lot of learning to do and still am learning. Um, but I also believe in the healing because the site of George Floyd's death is now the largest shrine that I've ever seen anywhere. Um, other than another country like like Mexico City um, in in the United States, I haven't seen that kind of thing, like out on a street corner, just a huge flowers and stuffed animals and signs and, you know, all these symbols of gratitude. So, you know, within all the sadness and harm and pain and generational trauma, I do feel that I also see like this healing energy coming forth. And, and a lot of it is, is not within the institutions. A lot of it is happening in the street or it's happening in the backyard, you know? So I just really encourage all of, all of the herbalists to keep believing in that because um, while one society and system is falling down, there's another one that's growing up at mm -hmm. the same time. Mm -hmm. So you can look at the world as falling apart or you can look at the world as 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 growing anew and what what are you which side are you going to be a part of <laughs> and and we don't really know what the future holds it's the most mysterious future ever in my opinion <laughs> yeah. yeah i like that word applied we are a mystery people i don't think that you know we like to think that the bible or this or that dictates where we're going to go but Ultimately, I had to I had to conclude we are a mystery people. My friend Susan died just in December, and uh, one of the last things she said before she had a stroke, she could still talk for the last four years, but not. But it was one of the last elegant things. Let's see if I can eloquent. Um, there's a there's a turtle graveyard at the bottom of the ocean. Nobody knows why the turtles go there to die. It's a mystery. There will be great mysteries that will be unfolded as the earth changes and they will penetrate to our bones. If we're not ready, our bones will shadow, shatter. It's like, whoa. <laughs> so from this, I just began to realize, yes, we are mystery people. Our destination is a mystery or it's never maybe permanent. We'll just go on and on. 
right now we're kind of like a lost children in paradise or something or or, or i feel like we're very we're a very immature uh species <laughs> so matthew i'm just the the right at the end what i was catching is she said if our bones are not ready our bones will shatter uh -huh. and it made me think of like the ancestors the oh. bones the healing of the ancestors like we cannot ignore yeah. the injustices we cannot ignore the past we cannot ignore the generational trauma we have to heal like we have to see we have to learn to heal it well there's also mysteries that will unfold that we don't understand yet so of course i know I know it's frightening. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And so Mino works in the Minneapolis public schools. And I would have to say that education goes on despite the board of education. <laughs> you just Ooh. told me after another, it's just unbelievable what bad decision making they've done. So I guess not quite so bad as the Minneapolis library that built <laughs> building and went bankrupt and had to be absorbed by another. well I, you know what it is is that when you are when you shut the door and you're alone with your students it's precious moments it is precious moments right now our students uh who are in high school i'm teaching high school right now so they were um let's say they were in middle school when the pandemic hit and the lockdown started and um, actually, a lot of my students are from uh, Ecuador and other countries, um, Afghanistan and so on. So they've been through a lot already, just in the amount of time it took them to come to me. They've lived lifetimes, I'm sure, having left their home countries. But um, the students, ha they uh, dealt with so much isolation and they have um, so much healing. But when you're together, it's almost like nowadays, I feel like I'm almost teaching emotional, social, emotional skills more than anything because the they lost out, especially in middle school when you want to be with your friends and you're not allowed to be with your friends, you're locked away. So the only, you know, and then of course the, there's the internet, which um, that we told them to go online. And so then they went online and now we can't get them out. They're down there. It's almost, I don't know what it, I don't know. Uh, the internet is like, uh, like an, um, I recently heard someone say it's like part of the nervous system. It's like an, a universal nervous system for all of us or something. And I, I, I don't know. I, I guess I could, they say that Mercury represents the mind and Jupiter represents the higher mind, like philosophy and Uranus represents like the the transpersonal which is kind of like the internet the the transpersonal mind and it's so important and yet like even as a teacher like I'm trying to get a grasp on it and I can't and my yeah. students uh they're just kind of down the rabbit hole like half the time they're on their phones and Minneapolis does not have a law or they doesn't the public schools don't have a law against the phones so um constantly telling them to put it away but you know it's it's like to me it's really precious that we can be together and they they say they suffer from depression more highly now than they did before because they're online more i don't know if any of you have any herbal suggestions <laughs> because i what i love about art is i can actually give people things to do put in their hands paintbrushes, sketchbooks, you know, the real world sort of, not the online world. And here we are connecting via online and that's great. But the majority of our day, yeah. I would hope we don't spend online. <laughs> uh. I, I kind of like to think of it like this and I'm not an astrologer, but I, I dabble a bit is that we're moving into the age of Aquarius and the Aquarius is the nervous system. It is the mind. It is hypersensitivity. And when we think about the symbol of Aquarius is Aquarius is air, but the Aquarius person is carrying the water jug. 
and the water jug is emotions. And so, and the, and the queerest person is bending under the weight of emotions to, to their hypersensitivity, their hyper nervous system sensitivity. And what does, if you're on the lake, what does air and water make? It makes waves. So there's always this kind of nervous system, emotional wave conflict going on. And I think that's what we're going to be moving into for a while with Aquarius as kind of the over overview of where we're going and what's going to be going on. And my uh, uh, Sean. Yeah. I think also that um, it's like, first we had the mycorrhizal network where there were the spreading filaments, but they were tied with the roots and those trees rooting in with the network kept it grounded. And then the animal world decided, well, let's evolve and make these networks of filaments just be inside one being. But that being still had feet on the ground. And so as people, we're kind of like a forest that moves around and forgot that we're a forest. But then when we invented the internet, it's a mycelium with no rhizome. So it's not rooted at all. And we can choose to bridge it by um, remembering our own connection to the mycorrhizal network and when we're coming into engagement with it. But if we forget that, then I think it has this big magnetic pull that just brings us up and out. Maybe that is our talent through the Aquarian age of how to bridge that being all the way up and all the way down. Mm -hmm. Maybe we just need a lot of bug warts. Mm -hmm. oh. well, that's interesting that you said that. Minna, you teach art? Yeah. You're, you're muted. But I can, I can see your answer, but I just yes. want to talk to you. Hi, how you doing? I'm good. I love your brother. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> I and your mother, now that I saw her peek around. Oh. So uh, you gave me an idea because I teach art to uh, senior citizens mm. and you gave me an idea because I was going to mix watercolor with acrylic. Next class, I'm going to put flower essences in the water. Oh, wow. yeah. Flower essences, that's in her. Yes, mm -hmm. that's a way to get them uh, uh, to make contact without the whole... You have to give a whole lesson on flower essences before you even administer it. So this is a way to creatively just have them come in contact with the flower essences without all of the bells and whistles. What do you think? That's fantastic. And I love your pussy willows. Are those pussy willows behind yes, you? Yes, yes. Oh, that makes me so happy. Um, last year, I was one of the things is a lot of my students, as I said, have gone through some trauma. And um, they loved, they brought the art to me. They brought um, George O'Keefe, mm. so, who painted flowers again and again and again. And so um, we did some painting of flowers and we did it in sort of the George O'Keefe style where you, it's very abstract in a way. You're looking very closely up, you know, to the flower, to the inside of the flower mm. um, and, it's a very relaxing because of the watercolors. It's very relaxing. So I have found that watercolors are very healing. Yeah. Um, like, like I used to have a very active classroom with little kids and then you put the watercolors out and they're all just like, <laughs> <laughs> so it's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Very, very beautiful. And this is a lively group. So it'll, it'll be interesting to see the effect that it has on them. <laughs> But they really get into the art. Uh, last class, we did a stippling technique and uh, on canvas. And then I brought in stencils. It was for Black History Month. And uh, they uh, stenciled over the stippling. Oh. It came out oh. really beautiful. Yeah. Wonderful. Oh. So did you have portraits of um, Black, famous Black uh, Actually, no, there were, I found some nice, because it, it crisscrossed with uh, Women's History Month, 
as well. Yes. So um, I found stencils of beautiful African women with African garb, you know, the silhouettes and everything, but you could tell that the fabric had patterns in it. And uh, yeah, so, and then one man, cause I have a, a coloring book by a woman of color called I Love My Hair. And she has all kinds of hairdos in there, all um, types of hair. And I copied the pages and one man, took uh, the picture of Cleopatra and colored it in perfectly. I had some Mod Podge. I thought we were going to use Mod Podge for the whole class, but really he was the only one who was grounded enough and had a direction for himself. He did his stippling on the canvas and then we laid his, he colored with markers, colored Cleopatra with markers, laid his coloring his colored page on the uh, canvas and then Mod Podged it on the canvas. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So you make that, it into more of like a really wall hanging painting. Yeah. Made it permanent. Yes. So yeah. that it would not mm -hmm, peel off or anything. So it's interesting to see what comes about. And it also helps those who uh, don't really have a good handle on art, art, you know, feel a little insecure about it because I tell them there are no mistakes, you know. Right. So, um, but that little insecurity, the stencils help with that. Everyone ends up having something perfect, perfect yes. on their canvas. It, it strikes me, it must be worse to feel insecure about art in New York City than elsewhere. <laughs> Why? It's such a artistic, it's so known for its museums and artists and everything. I would think you'd feel like, oh, oh, I, I don't know about it. I don't, I don't feel secure. <laughs> it depends on the person. It depends on the person because some people will tell you that they're not creative. And yeah. I tell you, yes, you are. You just haven't found what you like just yet, you know, or what resonates with you just yet. But Everyone is creative in some form of fashion. And it doesn't have to, you, I mean, public speaking is an art, yeah. you know? So it depends on what you want to call art. Yeah. But fine art and stuff like that, uh, you just have to, to trust yourself. That's right. Because my mother taught me art through stick figures. She, she used to, she made cute little stick figures. And um, that's how I came to love art in, in its very simplistic form. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, let's see, Mina, it, entering the age of Aquarius, it just happens you were talking about Pluto. Pluto is entering yeah. the age of Aquarius with us right now. It's like yes. in zero degree or something. And yes. you discovered, somebody had written about this, that, that almost every transformative period in the history of mankind for 10,000 years, Pluto was entering Aquarius or is in Aquarius. So we want to talk about that and then we'll close with that. Uh, oh, that's so interesting. Yes. So, and Phyllis was also referring to Aquarius, um, which is the sign that is inventive and also at the same time can be tumultuous, but um, at any rate on on, uh, let me see, yeah, January 20th, 2024, Pluto again crossed from, it's a very slow moving planet. So it doesn't affect just one person, it affects like generations. And when it goes into a new sign, when it moved from Capricorn into Aquarius, it uh, will stay there for 20 years. Although it keeps having this problem where it slides back a little bit into Capricorn and then it goes forward. So for the last few years, it's been going back and forth uh, over, and I happen to be on the last degree. I, I was born at the very tail end of Capricorn. So it's been, Pluto has been going, it's been like, I've been like, get off my back. But now that it's moving into Aquarius, I'm feeling a lot lighter, but um, it's going to cause a lot of disruption too, because Aquarius is uh, Aquarius likes things to change. Aquarius does not want things to stay the same. They're innovative, but it's also this like, it's like um, a call 
for humankind to take up you know it's meant like don't don't be pushed down by the powers that be you know stand up so um the last so it takes pluto so long to get around the whole solar system that the last time pluto went into aquarius was in um 1789 which was right at the beginning of the american experiment and revolution and then the french revolution right after that where they started cutting off people's heads the royalty i should say and really the monarchies were really toppling at that time so it's been like 200 and 58 years since Pluto came back to Aquarius. Now, the last time Pluto, like way back 1800, around that time, is when electricity was first coming in. And there was all this invention. Uh, and this, I mean, can you imagine how much our world has changed in the last, in the last 258 years because of electricity alone? Okay. But um, so uh, Mary Shelley wrote the story Frankenstein yeah. right about the same time when Pluto was in Aquarius last time, which is interesting that that story has has continued to make uh, been so important over the years because it's about, you know, humans messing with like these archetype or these uh, elemental powers trying to to recreate life. And um, that story keeps changing, keeps evolving, but very Aquarian, electric. Uh, and also Pluto, which is about death and rebirth. So it's kind of Pluto is the planet of death and transformation. And Aquarius is this radical. The, I'm sorry, I'm doing the Aquarian. They has kind of the parallel lines that. You could say they're water uh, waves or probably more uh, electricity or light waves. But yes, there's been, as you go back and you research every time Pluto went into Aquarius, and um, I've been just studying astrology on podcasts and so on, on online, but historically um, the, the volcano at Pompeii was um, under Pluto in Aquarius the uh, invention of silk. There's a lot of dynamics about weapons and gunpowder that was created during Pluto and Aquarius period. A lot of fights about religion where one old religion is overthrown, like in Rome when the Christian, uh, when Rome became a Christian um, empire rather than a pagan uh, with the old Greek gods, the old uh, Roman gods and so these these different epochs. And so we're now entering into another epoch when um, the one thing we can be sure about with Pluto and Aquarius is that we won't be able to go back and that nothing will be the same as it was before. So we, but because uh, Aquarius is so unexpected, there's a lot of the unexpected in Aquarius um, because it likes change, radical change. Uh, we don't also know what exactly is going to happen. Mm -hmm. So there's, it's kind of like all these balls are in the air. One of the things they're saying though, is the um, evolution of AI and technology is happening at a really rapid pace right now. So, and with Pluto, oh, it can be really used for very manipulative, bad, you know, you, we have to be, we have to be careful because we don't even know what's real and what's not anymore. Um, so yeah, we have to stay grounded and actually as herbalists, this yeah. is something you're excellent at. Go outside, get your feet on the ground, you know, ha have your hands on the trees and um, make sure that um, you're grounded and centered in what you know, you know, and, and then share that. Well, let's end the class there. That's like perfect for Herbless Day. That was like needs to be quoted and put on a yard sign or something. And thank you, Mina. Thank you, everybody. And yes, Tara and Susan, who's maybe not here with us, or maybe she is there. And uh, everybody. And um, uh, the, I, this was really an exciting, interesting class. I'm, I'm really kind of blown away. It was like, 
we didn't plan it at all, really. So um, it's really been an exceptional, great time, really been fun for all of us, I think, that are presenting and hopefully for you guys and whoever watches this in, from our library or wherever. So we'll turn it over to Tara and the rest of us herbalists can bow out. And I kind of want to re-listen to Mina's closing words there again. We'll, we'll have to write those down. So. <laughs> okay. Bye. Bye, everybody. Nice Thank meeting you, you Mina. Uh, yeah. Pleasure. Good night. And so last minute, yes, Matt, we've done well for, uh, on a yeah. number of occasions, just winging it. <laughs> right, right, yeah. Good. So those who are still hanging around, um, I'll just review for you. And those who just showed up too, uh, we're still going live on uh, YouTube. And so you, like I just announced, you can, we have free events like this going on all the time. So just head on over to the Matthew Wood Institute of Herbalism.com. For example, tomorrow night, we have Bitter Herbs with Matthew Wood and Phyllis D. Light. So just the practical, why do we eat bitter herbs? Why is it in certain traditions and rituals? Will surely be a fascinating class. This will be full of Materia Medica as well. Um, as we plan this one, uh, there'll be a lot of amazing details. Uh, they have an upcoming class also on the herbs for the musculoskeletal system. For a limited time, you can also sign up to watch the free herbal first aid for acute conditions and the Q&A regarding that class. Just click here and you can sign up for that. And you can also sign up for the upcoming related class, Herbs for the Musculoskeletal System, well, the, where they will go into much more detail in this workshop. And uh, you can attend live, ask questions, and so forth. You can get all the details here. And if you haven't already, absolutely download these free Materia Medica cards. They are the latest and greatest of Matt's materials on Materia Medica. If you have his books, which we obviously highly recommend, this has the most up-to-date information and it's terrific for beginner to advanced herbalists. There's, there's something in here that you will absolutely treasure, um, something for everybody from IDing the plant in different parts of the plant to tissue states, energetics, uh, the tastes, uh, any analogs. I mean, so it's just full of information. So I highly recommend that you download those those cards. Also, going back to the top here, we are still enrolling in the year one program. You can become a Matthew Woods certified herbalist and enrollments up open for a couple more weeks and get on our newsletter list because you'll also that's how you'll also learn about these events and others that are not always announced. There's just always so much amazing stuff going on, but we have our first scholarship program being released announced on Monday, Earth Day. So make sure to sign up for the newsletter to get all the details about that as well. And then, of course, the wonderful sites of our gracious guests who joined us last minute. We just put this together. Um, and so thank you so much to Susan Leopold. I figured I was like, I'm, I'm going to put it out there. I bet Susan's already taken <laughs> on Herbalist Day, but thankfully she was available to chat with us. Definitely become a member of the United Plant Savers for the $35 for a single membership. You will get so many benef benefits w above and beyond the $35 uh, for a membership and uh, coupons to some of your favorite uh, herb shops, schools, so many things in addition to the information they provide on a regular basis and the the great work that they do it helps support the wonderful work that they do let's see i'm going to move this here we also have this is the conference that matthew and phyllis will be teaching at in about a month i have here the location is absolutely gorgeous so check out wildmedicineconference.com and you can meet matt and phyllis in person which i know a lot of you are excited to do and then we also have other world well that's matt or sorry that's sean's site uh and amazing classes with sean as well check it out he has a new book coming out um in just a few months as well around the same time as matt and you can um, my banner here there we go um, weekly classes and that rotates here wild hope his new book and then phyllis d light 
just simply PhilisDeLight.com. You can connect with her there as well. And then I had pulled up before uh, Amanda, Amanda's site. Oh, that's not the one. I must have closed that window. Is uh, Alcamilla's, let me get that, Alcamilla's.com, yes. And beautiful site, beautiful offerings as well. And uh, like she said, she's she's going to have her second book coming out soon here as well. And there is one more. Oh, Matt's new book. I did put that link in the the chat on in both the webinar and in in YouTube. But you could also did I pause myself? All right. I might have paused myself for a moment, or at least I paused myself on my side. Did that go pause for you? <laughs> uh, let's see. I just typed in a shamanic herbal Matthew Wood, and you can find it at your favorite bookseller. Um, it's Simon & Schuster is distributing it here, so you can connect to a number of the your your favorite bookstores this way. Okay, I'm going to check the chat to see if we have any questions here. Thank you, Alberto, for posting those links again. And what a wonderful class. Wasn't that a fun, everybody? I think we need to do something like that more often. Have a, a meeting of the minds and uh, some fun chat. You know, hear what, what's going on in the herbalist neck of the woods, what's on their minds and their hearts. Uh, yes, uh, whoever asked about herbal dermatology, we do have a skincare class, um, not only skincare, but a skin health class coming up. So whoever put that in the Q&A, you're in luck. That is on the agenda coming up here this year. So lots of things in the works. Uh, we have a grand reopening coming up in June. Stay tuned. Make sure to sign up for the newsletter because you'll get all, all the latest and greatest information uh, and details. Let's see. Thank you, Pierce. <laughs> yeah, it did go pretty well for be, for weighing it. Well, it was a pleasure, everybody. Nice chatting with you in the chat as well. Let's see. And if that's it, of course, you can always reach us out to us at hello at woodherbs.com. We're happy to help there. And yeah, lots of amazing stuff to come. Thank you, everybody. If you're still with us on YouTube, make sure to like, subscribe, share, and we appreciate all those shares as well. Helps get the word out there. This was this was a lot of fun. Have a great night, great day, wherever.